Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I think this is gonna be a really great event. It's unique in that we have county and city candidates and focused just on the university district. So we're gonna have some fun. And as you might know, KUOW is right down the road. So fun local event for us to be a part of. I will, as Corey said, we're going to begin with opening statements. So each of you will get 60 seconds to grab the mic and give your opening statement. And we will raise a card to tell you when you've got the 10 second warning and should stop. So we appreciate you obeying the card. And I think with that, we can get started. After our opening statements, we'll move on to our questions from the local organizations and then to the public. Oh, one note. To the audience, I do ask that you hold your applause, hold any statements you wanna shout out that would be most appreciated until the end. And really the best way for you to engage is to do that straw poll and ask questions. So <clears throat> thank you for that. With that, I think we can get started. Alex Peterson, let's start with you. You have 60 seconds for your opening statement. And when you're ready, proceed. Hi everybody, welcome. I'm Alex Peterson. My family and I for the last 12 years have lived just a few blocks from here. We're raising our family. So the U District is, is like a home to me. And I'm running for city council to make our city government more accountable. So accountable to our communities like the U District and accountable for results like reducing homelessness and focusing on the basics like public safety. I've doorbelled voters across the district from Wedgwood U District, Wallingford, East Lake, and people really are just yearning for a sensible city council that gets things done. I have a master's degree in government. After that, I went to work for the Clinton administration at the Department of Housing and Urban Development where I worked on homelessness. I'm in the private sector, I manage financial analysts. We preserved affordable housing. As a city council aide here in Seattle, I evaluated complex budgets and advanced programs that work. And I hope to earn your vote tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Second candidate, Sean Scott, 60 seconds. All right, thank you, uh, KUOW page for moderating. Alex, it's good to be with you at this forum. It has not been too often as a black candidate in Seattle that I have found myself in the majority on a debate stage, so I have to thank uh, our event sponsors and everybody who conceived and put this event together. Um, I think this election cycle is really gonna come down to whether or not we wanna move in the direction of compassionate solutions or cruel solutions to some of the social ills that are facing us. I think that a compassionate city is one where the tax burden is not disproportionately shouldered by uh, working families, uh, elderly folks in their homes, or by students who are having to choose between textbooks and food. I think it's one where we have ample housing for everybody and ample social services for everybody. And I think it's about time that we turn our back in the city on cruel solutions, which also happen to be ineffective solutions. We've wasted $10 million a year on ineffective sweeps of homeless encampments that haven't gotten us any closer to addressing the root causes of homelessness. So I look forward to having a robust discussion tonight about how it is that we're going to um, have Seattle live up to, I think, the compassionate city and the progressive city that we say we are on paper. Okay, now we'll move on to our county council candidates, Gurmai Zahalai. Thank you, Paige, for pronouncing my name right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for having us here today. My name is Gurmai Zahalai. I'm running to be your council member for King County District 2. I'm running because it feels like every year life is getting harder in our region. I know this hardship personally growing up in South Seattle and places like Rainier Vista, Holly Park and Skyway. Every year my mom has had to work more and more as a nursing assistant, lifting people, cleaning up after people. And every year she's getting less out of that work. And uh, this is the story of thousands of people in Seattle where people are working more and more and having trouble affording basic needs like housing and uh, medical expenses and childcare. It's it's time that we address these solutions in a aggressive and 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 meet it with the urgency it, it requires so I'm running for King County Council to create regional solutions for the biggest challenges of this era I've been endorsed by all of the local Democratic organizations including the 43rd the 37th the 11th the 46th and I hope to earn all of your support as well thank you okay and now we'll hear from Larry Gossett your opening statement Thank you, uh, Paige. Uh, I'm very happy to be here this evening, just as the other candidates are. I'm particularly pleased with the variety of community councils, 
business uh, and commercial uh, associations and advocacy groups in the university district that are sponsoring uh, this event. I, I also have a 25 year history on the King County Council. And the last few years I have been aware because the county has one third of all the members of the Sound Transit Board are members of the King County Council. So I know about your issues related uh, to the 45th Street uh, new entity uh, or new interest and exit for, uh, placement that will be right out here in the university district and the issues about free flow of pedestrians that you all have raised. I know about the transit issues because we're over the transportation department too. And I know that you all want to uh, keep a little wider than the city is currently proposing Brooklyn Avenue so we can continue to have bus service there. Public transit is very important. I look forward to interacting with all of and you we're on the wrapping it up on the on the issues that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for your opening statements. Now we can jump into our questions from the local organizations. So we'll start, actually, I'm gonna start with a little icebreaker question. And you'll each have a minute to respond while we're doing these. I may ask follow-ups and, and I'll let you know if that's the case. So first question, should the AV get a local historic district designation? Like Ballard Avenue has, places in the International District have, Pike Place Market. Should the AV get a local historic designation? We can start right next to me, Alex Peterson. Thank you. The AV is a special place. It is, it is historic, and we need to do everything we can to protect it. I'm really happy that um, Sean and I co-signed a letter say, you know, asking the city not to upzone the AV. Um, and that's really important to preserve things on the Ave. And historic district is would be a, a good supplemental route to preserve as well. Thank you, Sean. So I would, in theory, as somebody who has studied history at the University of Washington, who is um, in love really with the history of politics and social movements in our city, say that. Generally, in principle, I would support a historic designation for the AV with a, with a couple of caveats. I want to make sure that we actually have a city that other people are able to come here and enjoy so that there is actual um, social housing, actual housing that people can um, afford here in the city. So as long as a historic designation is not about preserving the AV as it were in amber, but what we're really trying to do is preserve some of the small businesses that we see, POC-owned businesses, immigrant-owned businesses, um, as well as affordable housing units where they already exist. I think I would support it, but I think cities are dynamic and that's, they change. That's one of the reasons why people are attracted to cities like Seattle. So um, I would be curious to look further into what exactly a historic designation would entail before supporting it um, principally. But in theory, I think it's something that I could get behind. Okay, now to the county council candidates. Should the AV get historic preservation? Germay. There's no doubt that this is a historic area that should be protected. For me, I'm more interested in making sure people can stay in their homes and people are housed. And so Columbia City is, has a historic designation, but we all know that mass displacement has occurred there. And so I wanna make sure that we have strong anti-displacement measures, make sure that we're addressing the property tax epidemic that's pushing seniors out of their homes, make sure that developers are accountable and have inclusionary zoning policies, no net loss policies, policies that actually keep people in their homes and allow us to build affordable housing, and that's my stance. Okay. Oh, and Larry okay. Gossett. Oh, we're, we're hooked. There we go. Go ahead. I began by saying there's no doubt that the university district, given its storied history, uh, I can, I'm not surprised that people would want it to have historic designation. However, like a uh, couple of my uh, fellow candidates uh, up here, I'm concerned about maintaining the very interesting and significant number of women and immigrant and African American and other business owners out here being able to maintain their shops and their businesses. 
most of whom rent. And I don't know what it would mean to them being able uh, to grow. I'm very interested in the low income population that's still here uh, to have the opportunity uh, to have some of their fellow uh, family members move out here if we're able to build a few more low income housing. So I, I would, I'm gonna reserve uh, taking a position on that issue at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for all indulging my, my first question there about the AV. Now we're gonna move on to our questions from the groups. This first one is going to be about uh, transit or what some call buses on Brooklyn. And this question comes from the U District Small Business Association. So about 20, 21 organizations endorse the widening of Brooklyn Avenue Northeast to provide efficient bus to rail transfers to let the buses come in. And uh, the association says that would impact 24,000 daily commuters. And this, the association calls it a failure of the city and the county and transit agencies for not having a solution to this so far. So the question is, do you, oh, let's see if I can have the exact wording up. Do you support widening Brooklyn Avenue Northeast by six inches in each lane to accommodate bus transfers to the future U District light rail station. And we can start at yes. the Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, go, go for it. <laughs> I'm so anxious. We'll, we'll work our way back this way. Go for it. Uh, yes, I support that. I was, I'm an honest King County Council, so a lot of issues are relative to Metro buses come before us on a regular basis. And when I first found out that we only 10, six inches short of making Brooklyn wide enough for us to continue to have, or to initiate the effort of having some buses go down Brooklyn after we open the Sound Transit Stadium. I was very supportive of that, and I will continue uh, to be very supportive of that idea because I've been a strong advocate of public transit and making it available for as many people as possible in the U District and every other area of King County. Thank you. Okay, same question to you, Germay. Absolutely, I'm supportive, especially because metro to light rail connections are the future of our city. If we want to have effective public transportation, we have to have reliable bus service that gets us to the light rail, um, and that's going to help with congestion, that's going to help with the, uh, the climate. Um, so I haven't heard... Uh, uh, opposition to this yet. Uh, maybe if we talk to the small business owners or something and we'll, we'll hear what the reasons are, but I, I don't see a reason why we wouldn't do that. Okay, thank you. And to the city council candidates, Sean Scott. Right, so I think the climate crisis is real. I support uh, widening uh, Brooklyn Avenue to make it more hospitable to buses. Um, I'm happy to be the only candidate in the District 4 City Council race who supported Sound Transit 3, uh, who supported the Moose Seattle levy. We've been endorsed in this race by the Transit Writers Union as well because of our support for the Orca for All program, which would make transit universally or closer to universally accessible um, in the city of Seattle. Um, and so I think that there's a lot that cities can do to model good behavior around meeting the climate crisis at the scale that it exists. And I think certainly widening one of our streets with you know a great amenity like a new coming um, subway station that's going to be here in a few years is the least that we can do um, to encourage a culture where people are exploring the city on foot uh, via transit and reducing the single biggest source of our city's carbon emissions which comes from transportation so an unequivocal yes okay and same question to you alex buses on brooklyn yes Absolutely. So we want to be able to move the most people as efficiently as possible. And as was said, bus to light rail is key. Um, Sound Transit 3, there was, it's funded regressively. It's unfortunate, but, but people passed it and we need to make the most of it. And we're going to have not only the Brooklyn Station, but the Roosevelt Station opening up. We need to get as many people to ride light rail as possible. But this is why you need experience to get things done, because this was a, such a bureaucratic mess with University of Washington, Sound Transit, King County, and City of Seattle all pointing the fingers at each other. We had a vacuum of leadership in this district with Rob Johnson here who could have taken action. I would encourage us all to sign another letter. I mean, if, the, if all of us agree, let's sign a letter and let's send it to the city to expand it. And it's, by the way, it's six inches on both sides, so it's actually a foot. So I would definitely support it. 
Okay, any bus riders on stage? Any, any free, regular bus riders? All right, and, and if I could ask a, a follow-up for anyone who wants to add, what would be, uh, how would you make it happen since everyone on stage supports widening Brooklyn Avenue? Does anyone have an idea of how to get there since there's not a solution yet? Yes, um, does it matter who goes first? Go ahead. Okay, so. Uh, let's do 30 I, seconds. I ride the 74, but it doesn't go down, I mean, doesn't impact Brooklyn, but um, this, it's, we really need to start with the city of Seattle. I mean, the city of Seattle controls the sidewalks and then who, who owns that land, which is part, which is different groups. So, but the city of Seattle can lead the charge on this. And so I, I look forward to working on it if elected. Um, and we've got both county council members saying that they would be for it. So that's, that's a huge benefit for King County Metro. Uh, so then it's the University of Washington and Sound Transit need to get on board. So we need to push them and, and work collaboratively with them, see why it's in their best interest to get the buses flowing down there. Anyone else wanna jump in before we go to the next? It would definitely I, take collaboration between the city and the county uh, at the city level. I assume that's where you would change the uh, actual width of the streets. And then at the county, you would work with uh, Metro to make sure that the route is able to go down that street. Uh, <clears throat> Madam moderator, I'm very confident that the King County Council, all eight of whom are on the council with me, have endorsed me. I'm sure that we can influence them. I've been endorsed by five members of the city council. I think it's very possible to revisit this issue and get a change. And we have one third of the members of the Sound Transit Board. So I think it's, it'll be possible for us to get the six inches on either side expanded so that we have the option of establishing bus transportation on Brooklyn. Okay. All right. And so we're going to move on to our next question, which is from the U District Community Council. The U District, now we're, we're transitioning away from transit and more toward the issues of crime and the criminal justice system with this question. The U District has experienced instances of, uh, of violent crimes, of violent assaults, some cases where people are released from custody and may shortly thereafter go on to reoffend, And the council, the U District Community Council has pointed to an instance of a suspect who was arrested for something, for a stabbing in January, released in August. And their question is, what will you do to address a public safety issue of this severity that's routinely happening in our community today? And let's start with the uh, city council candidates first. Whichever one of you wants to jump in. So, so thanks to the business improvement areas throughout the city who um, put together the, this prolific offenders report. It's some, it's data that really the city government should have put together, and it, and many of you may have heard of this report. Um, where people are arrested and then they're they're released quickly for various reasons, um, but but they're then go and commit other crimes, uh, allegedly commit other crimes. So it's a combination of things that needs to happen to reduce violent crime and reduce repetitive crime like that. Um, it's both you know working upstream to prevent crime and and help people before they commit these crimes. It's to divert people away from the criminal justice system. The, the law enforcement, the um, law enforcement assisted diversion program lead. I support expanding that program. But when somebody's committing violent crimes, that's something that will require uh, police intervention. And I think we need, we do need to support the, the good work of our first responders. We need to hold them accountable. We need to have fully implement the consent decree, but we also need to encourage them that to, to deal with this, and that also involves uh, city attorney getting him to, to work harder. Okay, same question right. to you, Sean. Mm -hmm. So very early in my campaign for uh, District 4 and City Council, I met with the University of Washington victim advocate who indicated to me that as big of a concern as violent crimes of the sort that you mentioned are, and we'll work our way back around to addressing that issue in particular, 
Issues like intimate partner violence, stalking, harassment are equally big concerns, especially for members of the LGBTQIA plus community on campus here in District 4. I think that I would like to see something like a UW victim advocate um, transferred over to the, to the um, Seattle Police Department or uh, an equivalent thereof created with the Seattle Police Department. I also support uh, law enforcement assisted diversion. I was a campaign manager for the late Darren Morris and he was a champion on not only um, lead but also giving it the progressive revenue and funding that it needed to succeed. Um, but I also think it's about holding our police, our police force accountable. I'm the only candidate in this race who said that I would not have voted for the most recent Seattle Police Officers Guild contract, which the ACLU, among other community groups represented, um, said was a disaster for police accountability. So I think it's about getting our police force back into compliance with the consent decree um, and moving from there. Okay. Thank you. Now to county candidates, and I can uh, re repeat the question. What will you do to address violence in the community and public safety issues of this severity and repeat offenders? I'm a big fan of the LEAD program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. Uh, in, the initial, uh, in the initial report out that they had, they showed that people who go through this program, which matches people to case managers who address, address root causes, of, uh, that led to a 60% reduction in future likelihood of uh, committing crime and being arrested. And the reason why programs like that work is that they're addressing root causes and not just cycling people through jail and homelessness and uh, the other ills in our society and other programs that have worked like that. How many people here have heard of Oakland's Focus Deterrence Program? A great program where Oakland had a huge spike in gun violence. Instead of going down the route of just arresting everybody and taking everybody to jail, they did early intervention, used data to identify who was most likely to participate in gun violence, connected them to all kinds of resources, case managers, counselors, and they saw a 50% reduction in gun violence. Other programs that have worked in other cities, cognitive behavioral therapy to teach men, especially young men, how to manage their anger because toxic masculinity is a real thing and so having these alternatives that address root causes are the way that we should go okay same question to you Larry Gossett I also uh, support the idea that public safety can best be created by having alternatives I read a report last week uh, that said that 73 uh, percent of all homeless people who are high and frequent utilizers of the King County Jail, either for misdemeanor or more violent crimes, uh, commit very few crimes once they get a roof uh, over their heads. Our, we have a building down here that we built at 1812 East Lake, and we allow people to continue to drink and get high. Yet with that, we still had the 84 men uh, and two women living there create far fewer crimes than they ever had and visit Harborview Hospital far fewer times than they ever had. I think the emphasis need to be on, on, on uh, housing. I'm also a founder uh, of the LEAD program with Lisa Dugard and I know that's an option as others have mentioned. Okay, thank you. And with that, we're out of time for that question. Move on to our fourth question of the night from the U District Advocates. First, I'll say, who's heard of the high rises going in in the U District? A few tall buildings, okay, some under construction now. So the U District's getting denser with high rises, but at the same time, there's becoming a deficit of, of open space, public space, parks, area for people to walk, recreate. And we currently, according to the advocates, have a five acre deficit of public open space, which equals two city blocks, but the streets are underutilized. Here's the question. Do you support revitalizing the Ave into a pedestrian priority street, rerouting buses off the Ave, and how do you think we should get there, if so? So let's, um, let's mix it up and start with the county this time. This question about revitalizing the Ave into a pedestrian priority destination. And whose proposal did, did you say that is? This question is from U District Advocates. Yeah, okay, the U District Advocates. Um, I think that I could favor if you have overwhelming 
community support uh, for us to de-emphasize buses on University uh, Ave uh, to encourage pedestrian. I'd only heard before the night that when we build a new uh, transit station on 45th Northeast, uh, people want us to make it as pedestrian friendly as possible so that people can walk the buses, uh, walk home, uh, take advantage of all the diverse uh, stores and businesses and eating establishments uh, on on the Ave. Um, so that's that's my response. Okay, thank you, Gurmai. I'm supportive of the proposal that the U district of, of the U district mobility plan, where uh, it's proposed that we work with the city to make sure that uh, between 45th and 42nd are pedestrian priority uh, streets and you put buses down Brooklyn and, and, and around those areas to have metro to light rail stops. But as more and more pedestrians come to this station, given the growth of the city, the area, and the new link light rail stop, we are gonna have way more people on the street. And if we're going to make sure that pedestrians are safe and that the businesses have foot traffic, we are going to have to prioritize pedestrians. And so I'm supportive of that plan to prioritize pedestrians and reroute cars and metro around that stretch between 15th and Brooklyn and 45th and 42nd. Okay. So to Sean, and I'll just repeat it, do you support removing buses from the Ave, giving pedestrians priority? If, if so, how do we get there? I do. I. Um, heed the recommendations of the U District Mobility Group um, and have um, heeded them since declaring my candidacy um, in November of last year in saying that when we look at Pioneer Square, we see Occidental Street, a street that is pedestrianized where people are walking to and fro on game day, able to go to some of the bars and coffee shops that are there. We can have the absolute same thing here in the University District. Um, while we're talking about experience, that is a neighborhood outreach process that is going to have to steward that to make sure that we're not disprivileging um, some storefront owners that might have a need for freight for having supplies and materials dropped off. And I have worked for the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs directing a pretty ambitious public outreach process to have King Street Station transformed into an arts and culture hub. So that is a skill set that I would bring to the table as a council member um, in support of pedestrianizing the Ave. And I think placing this in the proper context of realizing that um, Seattle has to be really doing more to address uh, the, the present climate crisis and pedestrianizing major thoroughfares, I think, is um, a great step in that direction. So I do support that plan. Okay. Alex Peterson. Yes. Personally, I support pedestrianizing the Ave. It's, um, but, you know, you don't want to make policy based on your personal opinions. You really need to, to do that outreach. And fortunately, the U District Mobility Plan did a lot of outreach. It's a very thoughtful plan. Um, it, it does include, as part of the pedestrianizing of the Ave, it includes installing parking garages. So I'd be curious where um, we think the parking garages are going to go. That's an important detail. But the, um, the outreaching to the businesses is really important. I've talked to the businesses already. They are divided on this issue. Um, so I just want to make sure we get that consensus. It seems to be a majority in favor of it, but there are some, and I think you know, dealing with the loading zones is really important, timing those in the morning and then make it, and then just phasing it in 42nd to 45th is really important. But, you know, a council member is not a king, they're a convener and a collaborator, and I think we don't wanna just come in with our personal opinions. Okay, thank you all. And we'll have another question next that, that's related to the high rises and the growth going on in the U District, which I guess everything kind of comes down to is growth in Seattle. This question's from the Seattle Displacement Coalition. And, and first they say that in the, in the past three years, we've lost over 3,000 units of housing and currently risk losing another 1,000 units. Recent up zones have accelerated the losses and they say we'll, we'll never find enough dollars to, to build enough public housing unless we can stop displacement. So here's the question. Do you support a requirement that developers replace one for one the low income and affordable apartments that they displace? And what other actions would you take to preserve existing housing that's in the neighborhood? Let's start with the city council candidates. 
When one of you is ready to go, then proceed. So what, um, so we want to, there's lots of affordable housing here right now, and so we talk a lot about affordable housing, about constructing it, but we have to preserve the affordable housing we have. And one for one replacement, I support that. I support Lisa Herbold's council bill, 119629, I think it is. Um, and I think that should actually be expanded to other geographic areas in the city. We also need to think, well, why is there displacement? Um, and it's because the up zones actually encourage um, owners of apartment buildings to sell, and then a developer knocks them down, and then they, they're not building the affordable housing that we, we need. So we need to really look at the mandatory housing affordability program and refine that so we encourage more of that affordable housing to be built on site. That will require increasing those incentive or those fees, the in lieu fees. Um, we also need to, there's a program the county has actually, the credit enhancement program where they guarantee loans. Uh, they, don't, they don't fund the loans, they, they guarantee back the loans, low interest loans. That might help those landlords want to stay and not let their place be bought and demolished. Okay, Deshaun. Right, so we're happy to be endorsed in this race by the Low Income Housing Action Alliance Fund, um, in part because of our commitment to a one-for-one -one replacement. Um, I push back a bit on the premise of the question, which is that there's not enough money currently um, within the city budget or that we do not have the requisite streams of revenue to construct the social housing that we need. Um, the current iteration of the city council has suggested no less than six progressive taxes that would not fall on the working kinds of working people that are in this room, but would fall mostly on, frankly, the kinds of big developers and corporations that um, have backed my opponent in this race. So I think it's necessary for us to have a very frank conversation about the interests that we're going to represent when we get to City Hall. I think that um, we have been endorsed in this race, as I said, by the Urbanist and also by the Low Income Housing Action Alliance Fund. Um, because we understand that the kind of housing that we're going to need is going to have to come from progressive revenue. I think people are tired of getting soaked by property tax levies, as has been mentioned before, and it's about time that we begin an earnest conversation and an earnest search for progressive revenue that's going to get us to the point where we can actually build the social housing that we need and not on the backs of working um, people in the city. All right, thank you. To our county council candidates, and I can uh, recap the question. Do you support a requirement that developers need to replace one for one each low income and affordable housing unit that they displace? I absolutely do. And uh, just the disclaimer that, of course, this, these issues with land use and zoning are handled at the city council level here. Uh, but I absolutely support no net loss policies. I also support inclusionary zoning, zoning policies. We really have to address the issue of the MHA that gives developers a fee in lieu program, which is a huge loophole that doesn't actually um, incentivize them to build affordable housing. It just incentivizes them to use the loophole. And so um, making sure that they are more accountable in, in that way is really important. I also support having such policies for our small businesses and commercial uh, spaces. So if they are displaced in the process, giving them a right of first return to come back to that area, having mandatory uh, relocation assistance for our businesses that are displaced. There are a lot of things that we can do if we work with the city to make sure that people can stay in their homes and businesses can stay where they are as well. Go ahead, Larry. I'm happy <clears throat> that we're having this uh, meeting out at University Heights because today we had a Health, Housing, and Human Services Committee meeting where uh, I actually proposed and got through the County Housing Committee. It's only five of us. It's going to be moved on to the County Council's whole in a couple of weeks. Uh, two pieces of legislation, just cause eviction, where landlords and unincorporated King County, uh, the audience, you've heard all of us make distinctions between the city of Seattle, mayor and city council makes the regulatory zoning uh, decisions for every street in Seattle, but in unincorporated King County, the King County Council makes those uh, decisions. But we were inspired by the fact that the city of Seattle has just cause eviction, and we adopted uh, 14 uh, ways in which landlords can justify kicking someone out, but not in 20 days. We extended it uh, to 60 days, and we said if they tear down housing, 
they have to replace it if it's at 60% or below the average medium income uh, in the uh, uh, county of Keene. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If we bring the mic back this way, our, we'll, we'll turn to the crowd in just a few minutes. So if you haven't submitted a question yet, this is a good time to start thinking about that or write it down. And we'll collect them in just a few minutes. Or maybe he already is. You can hand them to Devin, who's right back here. First, we have a question from Seattle Fair Growth. And this time we're going to split it up. First, we'll do a question for the city council candidates. Earlier this year, Seattle's city council passed MHA, Mandatory Housing Affordability, which allows developers to build higher buildings in exchange for providing a small percentage of affordable housing, either in the unit or by paying a fee. The question for you two, what steps would you take specifically in the DU district to improve the MHA ordinance, especially with regard to preservation and displacement? So, I think more, I think about the fact that MHA is a market incentive program, essentially. Um, I think that we have seen nationwide in healthcare, in housing, um, in schools, sort of what happens when you leave big civic decisions up to the unfettered or even the fettered private market. It really is not going to do everything as far as delivering all social goods on an equitable basis. And I think that housing is the most, one of the most basic social goods that you can have. So I think a lot less about how to structure and tweak MHA um, as it is. I would let council members who have led on that issue previously, many of whom will still on, be on council um, if I'm fortunate enough to get enough votes in November. And I think more about what it would, look, what it would take to have a, an increased civic investment in social housing, perhaps um, instituting a land bank so that the city has the revenue that it needs to purchase land as it comes available on the private market and then distribute that land perhaps to not-for-profit um, housing providers or maybe even using our newly created uh, city county um, authority which is as yet revenue neutral. Um, I was looking for the stop sign. I felt like I was going a little bit long. So I think about, I think it's, it's about the fact that MHA is a market program um, and I'm really not running to be wealth management for some pretty well-heeled development de developers. I'm looking at what it would take to actually have increased public investment in our housing decisions. All right, thank you. And to Alex, same question. Sure, so mandatory housing affordability, I think there, it is a problematic program. I have experience in real estate finance. I worked at HUD during the Clinton administration, and I, when I was a legislative aide, we actually increased the incentive zoning fees uh, downtown and in South Lake Union, which is actually funding millions of dollars of affordable housing today. Uh, so MHA, that's why I was skeptical of MHA, and, and the, the whole community input process was, was poorly done by the city. There were lots of great ideas from neighborhoods, and those were not implemented. I think we need to look at the data. The people who, the architects of that program, Ed Murray, Rob Johnson, Mike O'Brien, uh, Michael O'Brien has endorsed my opponent, they promised that 50% of the units would be built on site, and that's not happening. And the data is not even easily um, available. So we need to look at the data, we need to tweak the program so it honors those promises, and that's probably gonna mean increasing the in-lieu fees. So developers build on site, and we have economic integration in our neighborhoods. Thank you, and now we'll move to the County Council. It's a similar question, but uh, I'll, I'll read a new question for you to the county candidates. In Seattle's and the U District's housing policies, there's not a provision that requires that we uh, save existing affordable housing in this neighborhood, nor does it focus on the problem of displacement of older homes in the U District. Many of those homes house low income or families. The question is, where do you stand on current zoning in the U District, and how would you improve on the Seattle law to provide more affordable housing and avoid displacement? I would talk to my friends on the city council because <laughs> we've already mentioned that the city has the primary responsibility for land use policy in the city of Seattle. And um, in the university district, I think we have to have some kind of combination. And I'm gonna be frank, I haven't talked to them about this yet, but I will after uh, tonight. Some combination of putting some brakes or a moratorium 
on allowing high rises to be developed out here until some agreed upon goal between community groups and the city council and the mayor about what needs to be built or developed or saved in the U district so you maintain uh, uh, agreed upon percentage of the housing being available to people who are working class or poor and then okay the bigger buildings and require that if there are homes that a certain percentage of them have to be affordable to the historic residents are on, that are working class and lower income. Thank you. Thank you. Germain. It's true that the city has the land use and zoning power within Seattle, so the bulk of the work will be at the city level, but there are things that the county can do. Number one, we can address the property tax epidemic that's pushing out people low income and, and seniors. And that's also going to take building coalitions, bolstering our advocacy arm, going down to Olympia and demanding once and for all a progressive income tax to offset the regressive taxes that are killing so many of our communities. Number two, we can help people with shallow rent subsidies, people who are on the verge of homelessness because they can't afford those few dollars between standing between them and homelessness on, on any given month. Number three, we can make sure that we invest the money that we already have in a more efficient way rather than continuing to increase these regressive taxes. One plan that I've seen work in other cities is investing local public pension dollars into local infrastructure and local affordable housing. That'll allow us to use the money that we already have in a more effective way rather than continuing to push people out through property taxes. Okay, thanks to all four of you. And with that, we've finished the questions from our local groups. How about a, a round of applause for these groups for putting on the event? All right. And now we'll have some fun with questions from the audience. So we ask that, and, and Corey, let me know if I have this correct. When your name is called, you'll come up to, where's the mic? Are we doing this one? Okay, so we'll have it brought up. They're going to be right here, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and you can just grab the mic. So come on up when your name is called, and you'll ask your question, uh, or we can read it for you if you would prefer that. This is not a time for comment, so come up with your question. And again, we'll have the straw poll at the end. That's another way to get engaged. So while we're organizing these, I'll just kick it off with uh, a quick one. What do you find personally unique or memorable about the U District? As we're getting these arranged, go ahead, Larry, he's ready. From 1964 to 70, I was a University of Washington student and I graduated, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> um, and then secondly, right around the corner here on 47th and 12th is Gossett Place, a facility uh, for formerly homeless people that is the only non-transitional housing unit in its 62 units uh, for formerly homeless people. We have five staff there. They can stay there the rest of their life. I think it should be a model for the whole country. Thank you. Those, that's what I remember about the U District. Okay. Any other memorable or favorite things? I had two first jobs during high school. Number one, I used to go door to door selling knives through Cutco. Anybody remember Cutco? <laughs> so when people ask how we were able to knock on so many doors, there's nothing that can compare to showing up to a stranger's door with a bag full of knives. So <laughs> number two, I was, <laughs> I did a, a, a paid internship program at the University of Washington my junior year while I was at Franklin High School. And I remember driving up with with my parents and seeing the big W and it was my first time on a college campus and I was sleeping there in a, in a dorm room on campus and so just remembering my first transition away from home and feeling like this is the place where adulthood started. All right. Sean? Black man going door to door at knives, huh? Yeah. All right. Um, I've, you know, I've lived in Seattle since the spring of 1992, um, have spent most of that time since uh, 2003 here in District 4. Um, and honestly, the first thing that comes to mind whenever I'm asked this question is the fact that my dad and I used to go for walks um, to Husky Stadium. We had Husky football season tickets the same year that I think 
The Seahawks had to play at Husky Stadium because the roof was caving in at the Kingdom. So it's, you know, the Hawks have come a long way. I mean, my, my, my fondest memory, honestly, was I think the Hawks lost to like an 0-4 Tampa Bay team and everybody was like, how could this happen? Um, and a decade or so later, you know, obviously the team is doing quite well. So I think it's a lesson in persistence and sticking with it and, um, you know, grand civic ambitious programs like the, the Kingdom that public dollars paid for and um, voters decided to have um, constructed shortly before it collapsed and fell apart and almost yeah. impaled a few people. Don't know where I'm going with this. Alex, you want to sure, sure. Right. I'm step in here? All right. Alex. It's good. So it's in this building, actually. In 2008, I brought my, my wife and my two-year-old came here because there was going to be a debate among Hillary Clinton supporters and um, Obama supporters. And I thought, well, this will be a great civic event and we'll get to hear this great dialogue. And we, we came in and we, we heard the yelling even before we got down in the basement where the meeting was and then people were yelling passionately at each other about Obama, Clinton, Obama, Clinton. And um, you know, that, that continues to this day where we have um, Democrats you know, arguing with each other to, for the greater good. So. For the great good. All right. Thanks you that. for. We'll kick it over to Corey and he'll uh, get us started with the questions. Okay, so we received quite a number of questions. We're going to alternate between the ones that have said they would like to read their own question and the ones that wouldn't. So we'll take turns back and forth, try to keep it fair. The first one, however, we don't have this person's name. So I'm just going to read the first few words. And if this is your question, can you please come up and read it? As a recently housed person after six years of homelessness, is that person still here? Oh, please. So I am. I'm a recently rehoused person after six. Closer oh, to the mic. After six years of being homeless, I recently am rehoused, and I'm housed here in the university district. I'm a lifelong Seattleite, born and raised, and um, so I have a question, obviously, about homelessness, since I've recently been completely immersed in the whole system. Um, one of the things that I've heard from my friends who aren't homeless is that they would like to know what exactly is happening with the homeless programs. And would you, as candidates, um, back a proposal or an ordinance to periodically report to the public how much money has been spent on homelessness programs, including homelessness prevention, how many people have been kept from homelessness or rehoused, how many affordable housing units have been built? Because I hear you say, Housing affordability around here? Um, no, there isn't. Right out that door there is a building that used to house moderately income people. I had two friends there. It's being torn down and another fairly high, high rise building is being built there, none of which are affordable housing units. Um, so anyway, would you back that? Would you report to the public in a way that's clear and concise, maybe publish it in the Seattle Times that says how much money you've spent, where the money went, how many units, and where have they been built? Thanks. Thank you. E yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and at the King County Council, we're working with the City of Seattle and the Suburban Cities Association right now to put together a new countywide uh, housing uh, advocacy program t targeted toward reducing homelessness in a very significant way and part of that is our regular reporting because about 15 years ago when we uh, initiated uh, ending homelessness in 10 years we were extremely embarrassed that after 10 years there were more people uh, homeless so uh, we've been strong advocates of sharing information and involving the community in the effort this time. Yes. Okay. Anyone can jump in next. Germay? Yes, absolutely. I would support uh, report out. And this is such a complicated question because there are so many forces at play that are causing this issue. Every year the federal government is giving us less and less money to build affordable housing. Every year, corporate, uh, major corporations like Amazon are dumping more and more money into local elections to make sure they pay less in taxes. Every year, it feels like our regressive taxation and our upside down tax system is putting the burden of building on the working class while the rich are paying far less in taxes. And so, 
yes, I support reporting out. At the same time, I hold I I I also support holding the people accountable who are actually responsible for this. And that is uh, speculative real estate investment, developers taking down all kinds of local services and affordable housing, property taxes going up a a along the light rail. So th there are plenty of people to, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> Sean. So I, I did not receive uh, today's news that um, Amazon's, you know, dumping another million and a half dollars into Seattle elections um, in good spirits because I knew that that was going to be money that was going to be spent um, to make it so that um, my platform doesn't get anywhere near City Hall, at least not with me as a council member. And I think what that means is that we're actually going to have the integrity and hopefully I as a council member I think would have the integrity to actually have the hard conversation around getting organizations like DESC, um, like Rooted in Rights and others that are doing important work um, around trying to get our houses population housed but are feeling cash strapped. It is definitely the case that a number of reports recently have indicated that our city's homelessness response um, has um, been plagued by a number of biases, racial number one, and I think we have not been doing enough to pay close attention to how the sweeps are, dis are negatively impacting folks with um, uh, mental health issues. And so that's a policy that I do not support continuing. I think we need to have more progressive revenue so that the organizations that are on the ground doing, to work to house, doing the work to house folks are able to continue to do the work that they need. Okay, Alex. Thanks for the question. I actually doorbelled, I doorbelled you, and um, yes. And um, you know, when I doorbell throughout the district, homelessness is the number one issue that people raise. And, and I get mixed responses. Some people are, you know, their, their hearts are broken about it. They wanna help. Others are very frustrated and angry. They see their taxes going up, but they don't see homelessness being reduced. And so I think, you know, making public sort of a dashboard of outcomes about where the money is going, that transparency will do lots of beneficial things. It'll make the public feel better about where their tax dollars are going. It will reveal where we need to have more efficiencies and effectiveness. It'll also help us get our fiscal house in order as a city government. We have a $6.5 billion budget now. But we're going to need more money for public, for a permanent supportive housing, and that'll help give confidence to do that if we have this dashboard. And I know Councilmember Teresa Mosqueda is trying to get that dashboard. I support the formation of the regional authority, too, to work with King County. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go for a question that um, I'm going to read. How important are programs such as tiny house villages, encampments, and safe lots in the city county strategy to end homelessness? Do you support these strategies, and what will you do to ensure their success? And then if we could have the, uh, Karen come up and be ready to ask her question after this. We can start where you're ready. Was it tiny house villages, safe lots, and what else? I'm sorry. Uh, tiny house villages, encampments, and safe lots. When someone's ready to jump what? in or I can. What was this third one? Uh, tiny house villages, encampments, and safe lots. L-O-T-S. Yes. Correct. Safe lots. For vehicles or RVs. Oh. I can go first if you like. Okay, so, um, so there are all sorts of best practices proven to reduce homelessness. We've seen homelessness go down in cities across the country. <clears throat> permanent supportive housing, or people getting the housing first approach, get them inside, and then people experiencing homelessness can deal with the, the crises they're having, whether it's mental health or something else. Um, so we, we need to implement best practices. Another good one is called the diversion program, not, not the law um, enforcement diversion, but diversion from homeless shelters. Be, so we actually solve their problem. It could be fixing their car, for example, get them, getting them back into their unit, diverting them from the homeless system. These best practices need to be applied. Encampments, tiny house villages, and safe lots are not best practices. They are part of the system that we have now um, because we are in crisis, but ideally we're sort of moving away from those, and I support the enhanced shelter model where you're bringing people inside and they're paired up with case management. Those tiny house villages that work really well have the strong case management. So I have been to Nicholsville here in District 4 twice. I was able to see firsthand the amount of pride that 
the residents there took in maintaining and upkeeping their community. And I think that they would be dismayed to hear that what they have built in the face of odds that I think most of us will, would buckle in the face of does not qualify as a best practice. I think that the city needs to be doing what it can to support people who have carved out shelter for themselves in the face of a homelessness crisis. We want to make sure that there's not as much of an antagonistic relationship between the city and some of these tiny house villages, which have proven themselves to be perfectly capable of governing themselves, cleaning up, making sure that it is a, um, you know, in, as I said before, in the face of some pretty big odds, um, a small beacon of resilience for a lot of these communities. So I do support tiny house villages. I support making sure that the city is has a good relationship with some of the encampments that have already been established. And I should iterate one more time that I do not support sweeps of homeless encampments which have cost us $10 million a year to the tune of $60 million a year over the last, or $60 million over the last six years. I think we would rather have that money spent on, on mental health and supportive services or um, other arrangements. Kermai? I also support them and I also am opposed to sweeps. At the end of the day, we need to build affordable and public and supportive housing and we need to build it quickly. All around the county, we see empty, vacant plots of land, many of which are shovel ready and ready to be built on, but because certain agencies don't want to give them up, they are not built. So we need to take an assessment of where these plots of land are. We actually already know where they are. We need to combine forces between King County Housing Authority, Seattle Housing Authority, and various nonprofit and community organizations. We need to put pressure on those agencies to release that land, and we need to build, 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 while making sure that we also put in place strong anti-displacement measures in the surrounding areas. I concur with what Germai just said. He doesn't hear me say that very often. Um, over the last couple of years, starting in 2018, we pressured the state legislature to change the law where counties and cities, uh, if this land that we own, uh, for various reasons, we own a lot of lands dispersed throughout the county, we can now give it to low-income housing uh, developers uh, for free, whereas before we had to get market rate uh, for the land. And that's going to be significant along uh, Martin Luther King Way, where we have a lot of little lots that were left over by Sound Transit. And we're going to build housing at far lower price than before, and we're going to incentivize developers, low-income home developers or other developers so that we can do that. And we have a five-year plan that Councilman Gossett recommended in December of 2018 to build 44,000. I want the public to hold us accountable for doing this if I'm re-elected. Thank you. All right. Good evening. I have a fairly specific transportation-related question. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about coming light rail stations and pedestrian pedestrian oriented Ave Brooklyn. Um, my question is, we don't all live and work and stay in the U District 24/7. Some of us work downtown. Some of us like to go downtown. I like to go downtown to play chess. Uh, will there be any corrections to reinstate the bus runs on Roosevelt and University Way to downtown? The loss of Route 66 on Roosevelt, 71, 72, 73 to downtown have had a huge negative impact. I used to go downtown in 17 minutes on a 66. Now I take two buses, 45 minutes. Okay, so we can start with whoever's ready. So I think, I think those, I absolutely would support um, making sure that we have some of those bus lines reinstated. <laughs> I mean, I live in Roosevelt right now um, and acutely feel um, the lack of, the relative lack of bus service from how I remember it was when I was in school um, here a decade or so ago. Um, so I guess my answer to your question is, is really pretty succinct in saying that I absolutely would support it. I think those um, what are known as redundancies are very, very useful when you have both light rail that's going downtown as well as, you know, maybe a connected bike network that can get people down there as well as buses. Um, what you're doing is you're letting people know 
um, through the way that our city is arranged that it's supposed to be explored um, not necessarily be an automobile and that there are a lot of ways to get around and so the more that we can do to encourage that the better so yes Yes, yeah, so, so like a lot of us have talked about, to reduce climate change, we need to get people to ride transit, and we're actually making it harder for a lot of them with these bus lines that have been cut. When I've doorbelled in View Ridge and Wedgwood and others trying to get their buses were cut, and they have to now transfer at University of Washington and walk over a bridge in the rain, and it's very cumbersome for people with mobility concerns, too. So the leverage that we have at the city government is we did create a transportation benefit district, basically a bus levy. That's up for renewal next year, so I look forward to collaborating with King County Metro to make sure that we have a list of all these routes that were cut and truncated and eliminated, and that we try to restore as many as possible, because we want to have positive incentives to get you out of your car and get you moving and we need to have those bus lines expanded not not reduced all right county council the bus lines if i'm elected you will be playing chess downtown in no time <laughs> <laughs> Um, I absolutely support those lines that you were talking about. We're, we, Metro is going to have to increase its ridership by hundreds and thousands of rides a day, and that's going to include talking to community members like you and seeing where the most effective lines are, how they impact your daily life, and that's what we need to move toward. We also need to move toward uh, uh, protected and bus only lanes to make sure that those rides are far faster, more efficient, have more stops for you. Uh, and that's the way that our region has to go, especially on the climate front. And we need to electrify our fleets. The nature of that question is very exemplary of the kind of issues that we're having to deal with around public transit here in Seattle and Martin Luther King Jr. County. Um, let me quickly say why I uh, uh, shaped my response in, in that manner. Uh, by November 5th, you all will be voting on a couple measures that if they pass, will dramatically reduce the amount of money that we'll have to support public transit on buses. That's the first thing. Secondly, we, uh, the majority of the King County Council, we thought that if we build light rail out to 45th and at the University State uh, Station, that we could take away some bus routes because in theory people would still be able to have public transit and it would be quicker. We have gotten a lot of criticism from that, uh, like from Rain oh, Rainier Valley. Uh, they said you took our buses off of MLK and in hopes that we'd ride sound transit. These are very challenging issues. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. I'm going to read uh, a question from Eileen, and then after this one, we're going to ask Mason to come up and read his question. Could, could we get the questions uh, emailed to us later? Yeah, um, actually. Because there's lots of detail, like perfect. the dashboard that you wanted, the bus lines. I'm not, yeah, it would be helpful to get Excellent. it. Excellent. Yeah, right. the June form, we put all the questions up there on the website, and we'll do the same thing this time because we, yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read a question from Eileen. Now that the new ADU DADU, that's uh, accessory dwelling unit or detached accessory dwelling unit, ADU DADU, regulations have been passed, how will you work to protect the family neighborhoods from massive development by speculators and the loss of their uniqueness? Anyone can jump in on this one, get us started on Adu and Dadu. And so in this question too, for those who might not know, we're, we're talking about um, backyard cottages, in-law units, apartments built inside the home. And could I just re repeat some of this? Um, how will you work to protect the family neighborhoods from massive development by speculators and the loss of their uniqueness? with those apartments in mind. Anyone ready to jump in? 
All right, Sean, go for it. So I do, I was, Alex is right, I was endorsed in this race by Mike O'Brien, and I'm proud to have the endorsement of an actual sitting city council member. I think it does speak to um, skills that I would bring to the table as a, a legislator um, of a sort at the city level. Um, so I did support his, um, this is an issue that he has championed for some time. I don't know that there has been a very huge issue with real estate speculation with respect to some of these backyard cottages that would, um, when we think about real estate speculation, I mean, I think much more about um, some of the kinds of development that we have spoken of earlier that is inaccessible to a lot of working people. My opinion as of now, and I would be curious um, to see who, who had asked that question to continue the conversation about this. My understanding as of now is that um, backyard cottages present an opportunity for people that want to um, perhaps have caretaking, if they have caretaking needs, if they have an elderly parent, if they have disabled family members, um, as I had at one point in time, um, having those folks be able to find dwelling closer to them so that it does present an alleviation for some issues that we might see around childcare and around, um, around caretaking issues. So I would be curious to hear more about what some of the considerations or concerns are around real estate speculation with respect to backyard cottages, because that's not an issue that I, as, as of yet, um, have heard a lot of concerns about, raised about. All right, Alex. Sure, so we want to have more affordable housing options for folks, and we want to have it ideally near transit. And I have major concerns with the accessory dwelling unit legislation that was passed. I think it was, um, what they did is they removed the owner occupancy requirement, so an owner no longer needs to be on the property at all. And that will, I'm concerned, open it up to real estate speculation, where they'll tear down a uh, reasonably affordable uh, single family home and build three units that are, all, that are all more expensive than the thing they just tore down. Um, there are concerns about you know having you know eight people living in each one of the units. There's concerns about parking, um, but my main concern is the one about the um, real estate speculation. Speculation, but we just need to look at the data. So what I would do is first six months of the implementation of the law, see what has happened around the city, and if we are seeing the real estate speculation, then we then we need to amend the law. We need to keep, this is just a general policy approach I have. Let's look at the data and let's make changes so that we don't have unintended consequences that are negative. All right, and I, so this really more pertains to city policies, but if you two would also yeah, like to jump in. Um, the reason I went and got a county brochure from over there, I wanted to show people that 55% of King County is in unincorporated uh, parts of our county, which is the green. And it has been extremely difficult for the King County Council to uh, maintain an urban rural growth boundaries. Uh, the best way we've been able to do it, in my opinion, is that we have allowed uh, fairly extensive growth within the largest city in our county, CL, and a few uh, other uh, cities. So I'm hesitant to say that infill housing is something I would be against because our population has grown about 200,000 in the last seven or eight years and we're still been able to maintain an urban, a relatively reasonable uh, urban rural uh, growth line uh, and we're really trying to prevent urban sprawl from going all over our county. This is another question that I have mixed feelings about it's very difficult to do to maintain balances, and one of the ways we've done it in Seattle is allow infill. That has helped to cause gentrification too, uh, so we're trying to figure out a way to make some of these units more affordable than we, than we heretofore have been able to. Thank you. Here am I. That's hard to see all the way over here. Yeah. I definitely support um, backyard cottages, it's a way to house people. We just have to make sure it's actually going to housing people permanently. So the answer is this and. Yes, this and we need to make sure that people are not taking advantage of this. I, I've talked to multiple families where I knock on the door and they say somebody's building an, a backyard cottage but now it's just an Airbnb haven where people are just Airbnb, Airbnb-ing out their backyards. <laughs> 
it's a hard word to say. <laughs> um, and so let's make sure that these are going to housing people in a permanent way and we don't have out of state people just investing in empty property and people are not just airbnb out their house let's house people in a permanent way uh, hi i'm mason wiley i'm the associate director here at u heights uh, right now we're in the process of working on opening up a safe lot here at university heights we're hoping to maybe in this parking lot you see out here around now you'd have maybe up to as many as maybe start with five and as many as 30 cars that could park here at night for people that are currently unhoused um, I'm wondering if that's something you would support. Right now we're working with uh, Councilmember Pacheco and he's been very gracious in helping to get city funds to help uh, pay for that through the Low Income Housing Institute would maybe manage it, maybe we work with faith-based groups in the area and other community partners. So I'd like to hear your opinions on that and if that's something you would support if you became, um, elect well, if you were elected. Thanks. Is that a, is Go for it. Oh, mm-hmm. Just making sure, is that a city council question or for? Yeah, I guess it is, sorry. City council then, okay. Sean and Alex, if one, once one of you wants to jump in. I went first last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll keep track now. <laughs> so our goal is to reduce homelessness and to do that we need to get people into housing That's that, and to get them the services they need. And there are best practices around the country. Safe lots have struggled. So it's basically where you, uh, people living in their cars and they are put in a, you know, a place of safety, like, like this parking lot, for example, be designated would be the concept of a safe lot. And it's been tried in Seattle, it's been tried in other cities. It's, it, it seems to be that you know, if you have really intensive case management services, that's the most effective approach. But I, I think, again, we need to make sure we're, we're doing what's proven to work and to get people into housing and get them the services they need. So a safe lot's not the end in and of itself. It's sort of a means to an end. So you want to do it well and you also need to engage the community so I think again the council member is not a king they're a convener they're a collaborator and I think we need to the council members job will be able to get that sort of input and communication going well I think that so long as the city of Seattle is in the middle of what even Bruce Harrell has admitted is a crisis surrounding houselessness I believe his exact words were a human rights crisis um, around the issue of homelessness I think that we would be quite cruel as a city to simultaneously not adequately fund housing services, not adequately fund organizations like DESC, while also continuing to criminalize people in essence for being poor in public. As long as that is the case, I think that I would have to support um, a safe lot. I think that there are a lot of things that we could do to make sure that um, neighborhood concerns and concerns that people might have around um, all manner of issues can be ameliorated, but fundamentally, people have a right to shelter in the city of Seattle. That's an, a commitment that I feel like we have to make, and we can figure out what the details look like as long as we start from that principle um, that people have a right to not be criminalized for being poor in a city that is not meeting its commitment to its most vulnerable residents. So I would look forward to working with um, this area, look, look forward to working with you on, on that issue and talking about how we can make it work. Okay, we'll move on to our next question then. So, um, let me go ahead and give this one to you. Sure. And you can read this name. Okay. And then the next question after this will be asked by Lisa, so just be ready when they're wrapping up. Okay, so this question's from Richard. How, and this could be for, for both, for all four candidates, how will you defend big trees from development pressures which are cutting too many big trees? See that, that sign in the back of the room reminds me of that. So how will you defend big trees from development pressures which are cutting too many big trees? I think we should start with the county candidates this time. The more I read up on trees, the more I see how important they are. Usually you just think that 
they're good for the environment and for air, but they actually are associated with reducing crime in neighborhoods as well, things that you would never believe. So we definitely have to protect our trees. I believe from a zoning and land use perspective in this area, that would be a, a city council issue, but the county has power over uh, the parks in, in, our, in our region, and so making sure that we continue to upkeep and in, invest in our green spaces are things that I would definitely keep doing. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Moderator, I've heard in uh, recent years that in the city of Seattle, uh, small trees do better than big trees in protecting the environment. However, I've also heard that we have to have, also uh, paradoxically for environmental reasons, uh, some big trees uh, because of the role that they play in a, a natural and built environment. So in general, I support our city having some trees. Thank you. <laughs> non -con Larry with the non-controversial take on the <laughs> issue. Um, so I think part of the reason why we've been endorsed in this race by the largest environmental organization in the country in the Sierra Club as well as by the 43rd LD Environmental Caucus and the 43rd LD Democrats is because of our commitment to green space and I think that this is one of those issues where we actually don't have to choose. If we are serious about um, meeting all of our, our climate goals, it's definitely the case that we're going to have to address the single biggest source of carbon emissions in the city, which comes from transportation and people on their work a day commutes driving pretty far distances because they couldn't find housing closer to the city core. It's also the case, as Larry pointed out, that I wouldn't say small trees, I think trees that are at a more ascendant phase, right? So moderate to large sized trees um, are much more, um, let's say, aggressive as far as how much carbon they consume, so that that's something that um, we can actually have a role in stewarding. In new development, as long as that development is not directed by some of the private market forces that I've tried to identify the course of this evening, I think, as the, some of the root causes for some of our concerns. There's, that's more not-for-profit housing development, that's more public housing development. We can have more of a say over making sure that um, some of those trees that are going to help us meet our climate goals are actually planted at the same time that we're addressing transportation through more housing options in the city. Thanks for the question about trees. So very important in climate change to have these large trees. The sequestration of carbon with large trees is scientifically proven. And we have to protect the trees that we have. We are the Emerald City after all. And we as city council members need to have a stronger tree ordinance to protect the existing trees that we have. And I'm proud that I was endorsed by the environmental organization yesterday, Tree Pack, which focuses on protecting our large trees here. And so it's really the that getting the city ordinance so that we're, we're keeping track of the large trees we have, we're enforcing it, we're protecting them from, from being torn out. Let's have a one for one tree policy as well for developers. We talk about the housing. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, they're not the same size when they get replaced. So, Lisa's going to ask a question. Three for one. All right, Lisa. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm a resident here, um, low income resident of the Ave itself. And my question is how, what will you do to support people with disabilities? living here, including a uh, mental um, substance use disorder, um, but also uh, physical mobility disabilities as well. Thank you. Gurmai, if you're ready. Yep. First and foremost, we have to make sure that those communities are at the table for the decision-making process. We shouldn't make a decision and then wait for the reaction to come from those communities. We should proactively reach out and work with organizations to make sure that as we make those decisions, their voices are being heard because far too often this city, this region is designed without those communities you mentioned in mind. Uh, one thing that comes to my mind, and this might be a city issue, is having the bike share programs out in the streets blocking people's ability to walk. We need legislation that compartmentalizes those because 
too many people are telling me they're going down the road and have an obstruction. So uh, that's an example of what we can do to make sure that we have a, a, a region that, is, that, that allows people to be mobile in an inclusive way. Larry, go for it if you're ready. And where, where is Lisa? Oh, okay. Uh, in King County, we have a goal of hiring 2% of our workforce, and we have 16,000 people that work for us uh, to be physically, mentally, or otherwise challenged. Uh, and, but what we've noticed when we give many of them the chance to work and do appropriate things about making the potential for them being successful, they have become some of our best workers when we have five and 10 year ceremonies for our staff. It has never uh, fail that the supervisors that give the awards out say not only just the most enthusiastic and personable person uh, on staff, he or she or they or them are the most respected because hard, how hard working and how easily it is to get along with them. That's within the county. In the broader community, we have fourfold and in increased funding for programs that put an emphasis on, on providing services and educational around this uh, class of people throughout. Uh, Germain and I can't went out and met with one of the disability programs. They're doing a great job. We have to continue to support. So I attended a recent uh, Disability Rights Coalition uh, forum, um, and I was glad to do so because as somebody who was a caretaker to my sister, uh, Nicole, who passed away recently, this is an issue that I have spent a lot of time, 20 years in fact, thinking about how to make our cities actually more accessible um, to folks with accessibility needs. I think it starts with the fact that we already have a city agency in the Disability Rights Commission that has been um, collecting data, making recommendations to city council members around this topic. So I would, rather than sort of say what, what um, sort of issues I have learned about personally as a caretaker, I would defer to them institutionally because I think they have a wealth of knowledge. I think it also has to do with the fact, and this has to do with the county level, um, our vulnerability index, the index that we use to measure um, how we're treating our most um, vulnerable citizens with respect to housing, currently does not do as much tracking as it ought to for um, disability and ability and access accessibility issues, excuse me. So I think that that's something that we would want to build the political will for at the county level um, with a couple of the candidates here um, and making sure that some of the new development that we see is ADA compliant as well. We haven't seen enough of a conversation about that at the city level because I think not many people bring this as a sensitivity to governance. I agree with what, thanks for the question, I agree with what everybody's set up here in terms of having everybody at the table for these decisions, the employment, and um, you know, also I, I guess I would add housing stability, um, that's very important, and, and money for, for mobility, so sidewalks is key. Um, one of the things I've supported for years is real estate developer impact fees, so when things are built, uh, real estate developers are paying into a fund which can go toward fire stations, parks, schools, but also to that infrastructure such as sidewalks. We have lots of places that, that don't have good sidewalks that aren't really set up for um, people to get around easily. Okay, thank you. We've got another question from the crowd. This one's from an anonymous writer. As you know, it was uh, just on Monday, Indigenous Peoples Day. This question is um, related to something that happened to them. The, the leaders of the Lummi and Yakima nations recently called for three dams on the Columbia River to be decommissioned and removed to protect salmon and to protect salmon runs from extinction. Do you support the proposal to remove those dams? There's a second part. How should the Northwest produce renewable energy while de-emphasizing dams? And while, while you're all thinking, I should add, this is something that would require also federal and state involvement, but you would be the county representative, so how do you respond? Do you support the proposal? 
How should the Northwest produce renewable energy while de-emphasizing dams? Since this is a relatively new issue on, on the, uh, the proposal, I mean itself, I would want to do more research on, on it. But for me, I want to listen to indigenous communities. And so that is a, we definitely need to be deferring to them. They've been using the environment in a sustainable way for centuries upon centuries. And now we come over here and we're in a climate crisis. So listening to indigenous communities on climate issues is, uh, should be a number one priority for everybody on this stage. So um, I haven't looked into this specific one yet. I, I would want to research it more, but absolutely defer to indigenous communities on this and in terms of more sustainable energy there there's a, a lot that we can do we need to make sure that our buildings are not using fossil fuels anymore we need to massively expand our public transportation we need to put a massive investment into solar powers and wind energy and i'll stop there for now larry go ahead um as one who has earned an eagle feather from the Muckleshoot Indian tribe in 99 when uh, they were trying to build their amphitheater and the King County Council said you could use outhouses and a lot of the white neighbors around them said yeah use the outhouses or, or why don't you build a new Indian school and teach weaving. Uh, but we got that done. They have bathrooms out of, they have the amphitheater and they have regular restrooms like uh, the rest of us. But on this issue, this is new to me. I, I would have to talk to the federal and local government officials that operate the dams and find out what are the purposes that these dams play currently. And then I have to talk to environmentalists and definitely I will be looking, listening to the Lummi and trying to make uh, a good decision that, that's the best for the entire crowd. When I went to the University of Washington, though, y'all wouldn't have heard me talking like this. <laughs> From the city candidates, either of you like to jump in on this? It is a new topic, just the announcement was made Monday, so new to you know everyone in the room too, but. If you'd like to say something. Sure, yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so what it's really important for city government to con consult with tribal governments. It's it's very important part of the process, that, especially in dealing with, with our waterways. Um, the Coastal Salish tribes have lots of um, connection there and we have agreements with them and so it's very important to respect when they when they're stepping up and saying that they that they want this it has to be looked at um, thoroughly and expeditiously I'm I'm proud to be endorsed by the, um, the it's a state issue primarily I'm proud to be endorsed by the state legislators who represent the 46 legislative district and so David Frocht, uh, Jerry Paulette, Javier Valdez, and then here in the 43rd District, uh, Frank Chop, Jamie Peterson. I look forward to working with them and getting the data on how we might be able to make something like that, or they might be able to make something like that happen. I think for too long, because we have had government officials that do not respect the concept of serenity with respect to our indigenous peoples, these kinds of decisions have been made um, on behalf not only of indigenous communities, but also on behalf of, um, frankly, well-meaning settlers like me that don't want to see city government sort of continue to perpetuate a very, very traumatic cycle of um, misusing, misappropriating, and abusing native resources and people in the area. Um, so I agree with Gramai as far as deferring to um, not just the indigenous peoples around this question, but also deferring to the immensity of this topic. We're talking about how governments are relating to one another across, in essence, national boundaries. And that is, um, frankly, uh, sort of an issue that I'm out of my depth on at this, at this moment. But I would look forward to building the coalitions necessary to address that question. The, the question of how we're going to wean ourselves from fossil fuels, I think, is a different issue, one that we have a lot of control over. I think severing our relationship with Puget Sound Energy, establishing a city-owned um, bank so we can disinfest from fossil, fossil fuel infrastructure is a way that we would want to go. Um, and I'm out of time. And I'll try to weave more into this in my closing statement. Okay. It's an important issue. 
Thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, my name is Garrett Cobart. You're going to get a break. This has nothing to do with housing or the environment. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm going to talk about surveillance or ask about surveillance. 24 cities in the United States, well, a couple of dozen plus, are under consent decrees, um, including our city. Chicago included surveillance as part of their, besides their abuse of people. Um, our city is completely unregulated in surveillance. They have a surveillance ordinance, but they don't really follow it. Um, we use a technology called automatic license plate readers that sample 2.4 million scans every 90 days. But we only have three quarters of a million people. So you can see that basically location privacy, it's a pretty intrusive process. We also have a SDOT that is using um, Acyclica, which is a technology that tracks phones for traffic purposes as well. But none of this is consented and none of it is warranted. So I'd just like to get your, your feel on this. Right. Well, I last week was the only D4 candidate to actually attend the public safety forum that was hosted by the Seattle Police Officers Guild. And I went knowing that I was going to have some opinions that would really, I think, push back against some conventional ideas that we have had about policing for too long, ideas that I think are incorrect. I don't support the expansion of police power in the city of Seattle in, for the most part, any of its guises until we get our Seattle Police Department out from what is, in essence, federal investigation in the form of the consent decree. If we had an Office of Housing, for example, that was under federal investigation for repeated practices of discriminatory um, rentals or whatever the case might be, we would have real concerns about the ability of that agency to continue to do its job. And so I think that standard of accountability, as my opponent would like to say, needs to be extended to the police as well. And I think we need to have a, a police force that proves itself able to actually engage in um, policing practices, um, a serve mentality before a warrior mentality, before I would support the expansion of some of the surveillance measures that you're talking about. And so implicitly, that also means that I think we should take a look at having some real concrete anti-surveillance measures so that communities that are more likely to be surveilled, harassed, badgered by the police are protected by the city while our police department is um, getting its act together, frankly. Yes, we need to be very careful about surveillance. And so the ACLU, I know, it tracks that and cons consults with the city government on, on those issues. and. You know, we should not be expanding it beyond what, what's already allowed. And um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Actually, just to clarify, it's not allowed. They just do it. There's no regulation. Oh, well, then in that case, they, they should not be doing it. And so the power of the city council is to have oversight over, over both SDOT and the police department. And so that's something where we could have hearings on and find out, you know, daylight this issue and then get information from ACLU on what's what's typically done in other cities that's acceptable and then and right size it based on based on those hearings down the line Larry accountability becomes very crucial in the issue of surveillance uh, I'm someone when I was at the University of Washington I was surveilled I hope I said that word right uh, when I got my uh, files from the Seattle Police and the FBI back in 1977, I was really surprised that they had followed me all day, about five or six days a week from 1968 to 1972. Uh, and that was a tremendous waste of money. <laughs> I mean, I. I got kicked out of the university twice, but I didn't leave. I just kept going to class. I said, y'all crazy if you think I'm not going to go to class. Uh, but we had, the Black Student Union had that kind of power uh, in this community uh, at that time. Um, but uh, now I just think that there has to be a lot of accountability developed before we surveil anybody. I see that there's a role for surveillance, but we got to have some checks and balances and some openness about it that government officials and community work on. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank you. Did you say your name is Garrett? Yes. Thank you, Garrett, for this question because it highlights an issue that we don't talk about enough, which is the fact that when we talk about data, 
often we use it in a positive way, things being data-driven, solutions coming from data, but data can also be very harmful in that it can either perpetuate a status quo or make things worse. So we need to be talking about how data is used by banks to discriminate against who, who they're going to lend loans to. We need to talk about data from the perspective of facial recognition technology. Is that going to keep communities safer or just be used to continue to harass and perpetuate the same inequities in the criminal justice system that we've seen before? We need to talk about uh, criminal justice records and how that keeps people from getting jobs or continuing their education. So making sure that we think about whether data is being used to make social progress or perpetuate bad status quo are things that I think we need to keep doing. Okay, thank you all for those responses. We are nearing the end of our time. Corey, should we move on to closing statements or I can do this? this Okay, let's dive in. Okay, okay. Uh, this is from an anonymous person here in the crowd. The U District is one of the few neighborhoods across the city that contains a census tract where the majority of households do not own a car. As a member of the city or county council, how will you advocate for those of us who do not own cars and depend on walking, biking, and transit for every trip? Should we do 30 seconds or a minute? 30, 30 second, rapid fire. Yeah, I think we've, we talked a lot about this uh, earlier today, but making sure that we have pedestrian priority zones, making sure that we expand bus transportation, making sure that we uh, make our streets safer for pedestrians. We just saw a tragic incident uh, yesterday where a woman was killed crossing the street uh, in, a, in an area that advocates had been advocating for a long time for more safety in that area. Um, so those are just a few ways and my time is up. So <laughs> I'll let somebody else go. Uh, repeat the question. Uh, so the question is surrounding, let me get it so I don't say it incorrectly. As a member of the council, how will you advocate for those people who don't own cars and depend on walking, biking, busing? All right. Um, I think that both the city and the county are already well into that process. I think that the majority of the elected officials on both bodies put an emphasis on pub uh, facilitating public transit uh, through buses, improvement in sidewalks, and uh, I read all the ideas that you have, you all have around pedestrian traffic and the new sound transit. We just have to keep building uh, and meeting with the community to suggest new ways of making it more pedestrian friendly. Okay, 30 seconds to Alex. The urgent thing we need to do is everybody needs to vote no on initiative 976, the horrible Tim Iman initiative. It's on the ballot with us. I think we all agree, vote no on 976. When the light rail opens up here on Brooklyn Ave, doing the thing that you, uh, the mobility plan wants to do is to widen the street so we have seamless connections for you, have great sidewalks so you can get around. Sean? So I don't own a car. I love Seattle and the people here too much to subject um, Seattleites to my driving. Um, I supported Sound Transit 3, support the move Seattle levy. Um, I think that it's gonna be about making sure that Sound Transit 4 um, also has the revenue that it needs and that we're working with um, all the community partners that want to see um, Seattle have a world-class comprehensive light rail system and eventually a subway system. Um, that's, that's one of my main priorities. It's part of the reason why we've been endorsed in this race by Seattle Subway and also by the Transit Riders Union. So, Okay, with that, we'll move on to our closing statements here already. So we'll start at the end with Larry Gossett. You'll all have 90 seconds and of course, watch the time card. We'll let you know when your 90 seconds are up. Each of you, you can start when, when you're ready, Larry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I got started in the movement for social change and political uh, fairness and involvement of all the people while I was in college. I looked at things more in a clear black and white fashion as an advocate for black power. As a result of the 25 years of experience, uh, of a large number of issues that have become more shaded and complex uh, to me. And I realize that politics is the art 
of compromise, and I've gotten very good at it. There are public transit and uh, environmental. I want to create a, a King County New Green Deal. Uh, I want to uh, facilitate the development of the 44,000 housing units that I pushed uh, politicians to uh, adopt, and I want to be more active in providing public support of uh, children ages 0 to 18, particularly those in the uh, juvenile detention centers and creating hope and opportunity in their lives. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this program on this evening along with all of you. Next, Gurmai Zahalai. I want to thank you all as well for having us today. Thank you for everybody on this stage for participating today. I told you a little bit about my story earlier, growing up with a single mother who had to work endlessly to provide for her children, and that's the story of thousands of people in South Seattle where I'm from. By the time I went off to college and law school and came back to South Seattle, everybody had been displaced. So many people had lost their homes, and so in an era of mass displacement where people are no longer living within Seattle city limits, the King County Council is going to play a much bigger role moving forward to address the major challenges of our era. We need to build 244,000 units of affordable housing by 2040. We need to get to that right now. We need to reduce our carbon emissions dramatically. We had a goal in 2007 of reducing our carbon emissions by 25% by 2020, which is two months away. We've only reduced it by 1%. We have a lot of work to do. We need to dramatically expand our public transportation. Our criminal justice system continues to be riddled with racial inequity. We have so much work to do, and I'm excited to work with all of you to get that done. We have been endorsed by all of the local democratic organizations, and we want to continue working with you as well. Thank you so much. Okay, 90 seconds to the City Council District 4 candidates. Sean Scott. Right, so thanks everybody for making it, our panel moderators, the other candidates, Alex, it's good to be with you again. I think that there's a pretty clear um, direction that the city of Seattle has to go in in this election cycle, not only in District 4 and beyond. I think in a post-2016 you know, um, political reality, I think where we have conservatives at the national level using um, illegal immigration very much as a cudgel to sort of reverse some of the progressive gains that we saw in the Obama years, we in liberal progressive Seattle have to be attentive to the ways that there are similar dynamics that are sort of lo working locally, where we have people who are really stigmatizing and demonizing and otherizing our, our houseless population on the way to reversing gains like $15 an hour minimum wage, on the way to expressing um, resentment towards secure scheduling at a domestic workers bill of rights, zoning reform that's going to get us more housing options for working and everyday Seattleites. So I would urge all of us to make sure that we're supporting candidates that are going to be on the correct side of some really big issues with respect to environmental and racial justice. Those are issues that we have tried to lead on in this race. Um, it has earned us um, the support of organizations like the 43rd LD Democrats. Um, and it has also earned us the criticism of, I think, some pretty entrenched groups of power in the city, including some pretty big corporations that um, recognize that we're trying to build a movement from below for the city of Seattle. Um, and that's not going to stop. I hope that we're able to get enough votes in November to sort of take this fight to City Hall. Um, and I hope that, by and large, that our electorate makes the right, cho right choices, not just in the District 4 race, but also across the city to make sure that we're going in the direction of embracing the future as opposed to, I think, some of the more reactionary conservative trends that we've seen nationwide and shouldn't want to be a part of here. Thank you, Sean. Closing statement, Alex Peterson. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight and sticking with us through all this. Um, I'm running, like I said, to bring more accountability to City Hall, and let me tell you what I mean about that. So I've knocked on the doors of voters throughout District 4, every block in District 4, and uh, that's 20 neighborhoods, 133 precincts. I did it myself, and I'm going back out into these neighborhoods again. And today I was in Bryant, and I met a mom named Tia, and she said that she wants a city council that, that listens to her, that listens to her community. She wants a focus on the basics of city government. She wants somebody who's experienced who can help reduce homelessness. I worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development on homelessness. Um, she wants somebody who increases public safety, who works collaboratively with our police department, our first responders. 
So uh, I believe that with greater accountability that uh, we can do great things together. We can create more affordability so we can afford to stay in the city we all love. This is why I've got a broad coalition of endorsements. I'm endorsed by several labor unions like the firefighters, the iron workers, the machinists 289, the laborers, the plumbers. I'm also endorsed by the Seattle Times. I'm endorsed by the, the state legislators who represent this area, uh, Frank Chop, Jamie Peterson, David Frock, Javier Valdez, uh, endorsed by Tree Pack, that environmental organization we talked about protecting trees. So I hope that I earn your vote on November 5th and look forward to working with all the organizations who organize this event tonight in the U District. Thank you. Okay, with that, those are your candidates for King County Council and City Council that would represent the University District. Larry Gossett, Gurmai Zahalai, Sean Scott, and Alex Peterson. How about that applause you've been holding? Thank you all so much for sticking around. This concludes the forum, but we do have a straw poll. Do... Um, Fill out the straw poll. As Corey said at the beginning, you can mark it with a pen or you can just rip it and turn it in at the front. And I want to say thank you again to U District Small Businesses, the U District Community Council, Seattle Fair Growth, Seattle Displacement Coalition, and the U District Advocates and KDOCs for the videography. Thanks for coming and get home safely.